This lecture will be on the Aristotelian outline, which is a basic way to organize your speeches. So you will be using this organizational structure for your informative and your persuasive speeches. You don't have to use it for your cultural narrative or your introductory speeches, but it's helpful. It's helpful to understand basically how something is broken down. And just a heads up as I go through this, this is one of your future assignments. You're going to look at the NFA final round speeches, and you're going to break down the speech using these parts. Okay? So this is speech structure, but it's also writing structure in general. I was very fortunate, very fortunate, not unfortunate, that my first class here at Valley College was a public speaking class. And the emphasis was really on writing and structure. And I learned my basic writing skills in my very first class, which made my English 101 class even easier. So everything from my speeches to my master's thesis all use this basic organizational structure. That's not to say some professors might want different things or ask for different things, but if you have an understanding of these parts, it'll make your approach to future writing projects that much easier. So every speech, every writing, and everything should start off with an introduction. There are various parts of the introduction. The first part is the attention again. Okay, so what you want to do is you want to grab our attention. You want, to, you want to pull us in with your speech. And there are a number of ways to do it. The first way is with your speech aid. So some people will start off. So they'll do a speech with about Bob Marley, as I said my other one. They'll say, all right, here's a Bob Marley video. Here's a picture. A few years ago, I had a student do a speech on boycotting Nestle. And she, the first image that she showed was of a woman. What Nestle used to do, allegedly, I don't know if any of this is action, but what they used to do is they used to go into less economically developed countries and convince women there that their baby formulas were better than breastfeeding. So what this speech was all about was that these, these practices were unethical and they were killing people. So she started off, it was a woman holding her babies and she did not have the, the, she didn't have any, any more breast milk to support her babies because she had put all her resources, her money, and everything into uh, the Nestle stuff, then couldn't afford it anymore. And I think one of the babies got sick from the formula because the water wasn't, uh, clean water wasn't available. So it was a woman holding two babies, and one looked healthy and one did not. The, the second baby looked like um, the poor baby was born to die. So when you start off with something like that, and that's why visual aids can be so effective and persuasive, we have that in our head. And then we have that in our head throughout the entire speech, which makes the speech much more effective. So you may indeed start off with your speech aid, but be careful of the timing of it, because if you start off with a video that's too long, you're eating into your speech. So again, if you start off, make sure there's a point to it. The next one is stories. Stories are used most often in persuasive speaking. One of the best ways to persuade people is to tell your audience a story about somebody else that's already been affected by this, and we're more likely to then believe we're affected by it. So stories can be great. There are two general categories of stories, the actual story and the hypothetical story. Okay, so here's the actual hypothetical. The actual story is a real story. Um, and this, oh, another thing about speech aids and about these is that it's a good way to, you, know, you have to have a minimum number of sources in your speeches. Use those as sources. You can say, according to this happened, as I read in, B, not I read, but you know, as BBC reported, um, here is a story. So if you have a story that didn't happen to you personally, you have to cite that story. Where did it come from? And that's how you start to embed your sources into your performance, into your speech. Okay? I get often asked, may I use or may you use a personal story? Personal stories can be a a good example is I had a student in class in the speech on texting while driving, and she told the class that her, uh, her sister was texting while driving, lost control of the car, and went up onto the sidewalk and killed a young boy. And that was very, I mean, she was crying. We were all crying during that speech. I think a lot of people who likely were texting before that stopped texting after, the, after that. So yes, you may use personal stories, but you have to be careful of making the entire speech or when you write a paper personal to you. And another question I get often asked is, am I a source or are you a source? So if you get up here and tell a story, no, you may not count your personal story toward one of the source requirements of the presentation, okay? Um, so next we have hypothetical. Hypothetical does not mean make up the story. Years ago, and I, you know, I don't remember what the story was about, what the speech was about. I remember just being so mad at this guy. Because he got up there and he told a story about his, his younger brother had been kidnapped and they hadn't seen him for years. And we were just, oh, it just sounded horrible. And then at the end, he said about my little brother, I was just kidding. I was just like, how dare you? How dare you? He, you never want to manipulate your audience's emotions, right? You can, you can 
persuade us. You can affect us without manipulating us. And honestly, I don't remember what his topic was. A hypothetical story is a story that you, you try to get your audience to visualize themselves. So if I go back to the story of the, of the sister that went up on the sidewalk, the hypothetical story is imagine you are texting and driving, and then you lose control of the car and you go up on the sidewalk. That's what the hypothetical story does. It puts your audience in that mindset. And it can be a very effective tool because then a lot of people have that, oh, it can never happen to me. I text and drive. I'm fine. But I'm sure that person that ended up killing that child thought that as well. So when you put us in that mindset, you have the potential to change how we view things. Okay? Next, we have statistics. These are numbers. Um, if this was my argumentation class, I would talk about a lot of the problems, potential problems with statistics. But statistics can be very effective. Say we have a five percent, especially in persuasion, we have a five percent chance, we have a ten percent chance of this. Um, still to this day, and it makes me laugh every time I think about it. One of the most effective uses of of, of stat statistics was a speech on sexually transmitted diseases. When the student got up there and she had it again, everything has to be cited according to this. This says this. So she had a source that said it was on average of one third of eighteen to thirty-five year olds has an STD. Okay, very effective, but then she said, look around. What that means is that on average, one out of every three people in this room has an STD. That was such an effective way to begin her speech. And the, the class reacted to it. You know, people were looking around, not me, you know, trying to make not eye, con eye contact and things like that. Um, because not only did she have a great stat that came from you know, a reliable source, she impacted it, which means she made that stat relate to her audience. So there was impact to that. So stats can be very effective. Next, we have questions. You got to be careful with questions because sometimes you might ask a question, you might get the wrong answer. But questions are you really used to promote thoughts. So the first one type of question is an actual question. Now, this is a question you want your audience to commit to. But again, be careful with that because if you get up here and say, you know, how many, speaking of, you know, STDs, how many people in here have an STD? You're not likely to get a bunch of people to go, right here. You know, so sometimes you might ask a question of your audience and it may not work out the way you want it to. A rhetorical question is a question to promote thought. So this is something like, if I, I pose a question, how many people in this room have texted and driving? So I might get that actual question. But people would admit to it. A lot of people, for some reason, people are proud of it. Oh, right here, I do it all the time. I haven't killed anybody. You know, people, you know, I, I don't know why that's something to be proud of. So you might then turn that into a rhetorical question. Has anybody in here sent a text message worth somebody's life? Then you get people thinking, well, no, I mean, that LOL, I don't know if that was really, did I really need to send it then? You know, there are very few, if any, text messages that anybody needs to send while driving, okay? Next we have, oh, so that's attention grabbers. Um, so there are other ways to grab attention. So read the book, the chapters on attention grabbers. There are many different ways. Some caveats to attention grabbers. One, don't grab attention for its own sake. Don't scare us. Don't try to freak us out. I once had a student stood up in front of the class, looked around, and then just went, ah! And just screamed really loud and scared the crap out of all of us and then said, do I have your attention? I was like, yeah, you have my attention, but you scared me. That's not... And, it had nothing to do with the speech. I had another student bring a paintball gun to class and point the gun at the class. Okay, that was when I stopped. I said, dude, what, 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 why do you think that's okay? Uh, I don't know how this process, but probably the one that freaked the people out the most. And it was a legitimate topic. It was on why we should not pick our nose. Okay, so it was a whole speech on germs and how we touch things and we pick our nose. That's how we got sick. Fine, good topic. This, the student, and I don't know how people process these things, like why, how this end up being a good idea. The student stood in front of the class, made some eye contact, went like this, shot a raisin out of his nose. So he had stuck a raisin in his nose, and then picked up the raisin and then ate it. One student was so freaked out, I mean, she started to gag, she ran out. And, and I, so after that, I said, why, how, how does that, you know, why, why? So, so don't scare us, don't freak us out, find appropriate ways to pull us into your speech from the very beginning. Uh, oh, another caveat is be careful of the timing, especially with video, especially with storytelling. Because I've had people get up here and they'll give me five, six minute stories to begin their speech. 
and then you know that's that's half your that's almost your entire speech. Make sure with your story you get to the heart of the story. What's the goal? What's the point of that story as quickly as possible? Okay. So after you're done with your story, what you want to do is you want to add a sentence, a full sentence that tells us why this topic is important. So if you want to do a persuasive speech on texting while driving. So you might get up here and tell a story, but you might want to get up here and say, according to this source, texting while driving is killing us. Right? So but it has to be according to a source. It's not according to you. So give us some information. So if you have a source or two here, and then you have a source with your significant statement, you've already knocked out two or three sources just in the very beginning. So tell us why this topic is important. And it could just be if you want to do a speech on cheese. You know, cheese is the number one selling, I don't know, product in cheese land. Whatever it is, you know, tell us why this, this topic is important. Now, a thesis. Theses can be a little bit complicated. So you might take an English writing class and they want you to develop a sophisticated thesis, and that's fantastic. So if I'm writing a paper, my thesis would be more sophisticated than what I ask for you in a speech. For the purposes of a speech, it could literally be as simple as, I'm going to introduce you to cheats. That we know exactly what it is you're talking about. And by the way, so for your informative speech, you have to send your topic in first. You could write, today I'm going to introduce you to cheese. So then we have that sort of topic sentence that we know exactly what it is that you're talking about. For persuasive, it needs to be a little bit more specific. What, what's your goal? What are you trying to persuade us to do? So as I say the persuasive assignment, you know, the goal of this speech is persuade you to use sunblock while you're out in the sun. So what are you persuading us to do? To, to manage your bad breath, to stop texting and driving. So give us a clear sentence or two that tells us exactly what it is you're persuading us to do. Next, we have the preview. The preview is part of what's called signposting. Signposting means posting signs for your audience. So just imagine you're driving down the street and there are no street signs and you don't have your app, you know, your map app or something like that. You don't know where to go. It's a similar concept in a speech. So as you're speaking, what you're doing is you're telling your audience where you are in your speech. So what a preview does, it lists your main points for your audience. So it tells your audience where they're going before they get there. So let's say, for example, we're doing a speech on cheese, and you want to talk about the history of cheese, the types of cheese, and the best nacho cheese, something like that. You would get up here, your preview, would, your thesis would say, today I'm going to talk about cheese. First I'll talk about the history of cheese, then the types of cheese, and then the best nacho cheese. Okay? So what you're doing for your audience is you're telling them the three main points of your presentation so they anticipate. And that's the point of signposting. It's like you're going to tell your audience where to go. And that's what a preview does. It tells them where to go. Here are my three main points. So this is part of your persuasive assignment. So when you watch those NFA speeches, you're going to identify the preview. After you've done with the preview, and your preview should match your main points. So if you get up here and say, my first speech is on, or my first point is history of cheese, your first point should be the history of cheese. Your second point should be the types of cheese. Your third point should be the best nacho cheese. Your, whatever your order of your preview is, that should be the order of your speech. Then you get into point one, this is the body. Every bit of information in your speech must be clearly linked to a source. A lot of times people just write out information. I will say, where is this information from? Oh, it's from New York Times. Well, how do I know that? Well, I read it. It's supposed to be in your speech. You're supposed to say, the New York Times reported. So every bit of information has to be clearly linked to a source. So it's info plus source, info source, info source, info source, right? So Unless you have some personal knowledge, you personally experience this topic, and you've always got to be careful of in embedding any sort of personal knowledge in your presentations uh, for informative speaking. It's really about the information that you research. This source says this, according to this, as reported in. So it's source info, source info, source info. And you have to say your sources out loud for your speeches, for your informative persuasive, you have to say. Right? Then we get into the transition. The transition is what moves us from one point to the next. Very simple in public speaking. Remember our three main points were the history of cheese, the types of cheese, and then uh, the best nacho cheese. Your transition would say, now that I've talked about the history of cheese, I'm going to talk about the types of cheese. Transition between. Now that I've talked about the types of cheese, I'm going to talk about the best nacho cheese. 
What a transition does, it moves us. It says this point is ending, now this point is going to begin. So it's kind of like you're going on a street run. I say, you know what? I'm going to take you all on a party bus. We're going to go this way. First, we're going to go to Coldwater uh, Cold Canyon, then Winston, and then Laurel Canyon. As we're, you know, I take you to cold water, we stop, I tell you about the beauty of this cold water canyon, and then I stop and I say, okay, everybody, we've left cold water, now we're going to Witsit. I talk about Witsit. Now we've left Witsit, we're going to Laurel Canyon. It's that transitional element that tells us what's coming up next, okay? When you're writing a paper, it'd be a little bit more sophisticated than my next point is, but you'd say something like, well, understanding the history of cheese is important. We have to figure out the types of cheese. You know, something like that. So to have transitions, move us from one point to the next. Okay? And after you've done this, and if you look and you break it down, you're about a minute and a half here, about a minute and a half for each main point. So be careful, it happens fast. This is only five to seven minutes for persuasive, six to eight minutes for, for five to seven minutes for informative, six to eight for persuasive. Then we get into our conclusion. Okay? So with the conclusion, you have what's first what's called the review. The review should mirror the preview. So if the preview says, we're going to talk about these three things, the review says, we just talked about these three things. So you would say, you know, and you, can, you can reverse these. I just introduced you to cheese. First I talked about the history of cheese, then the types of cheese, and then the best nacho cheese. You're reminding us, and that's the point of, of signposting. You are reminding us of what, what happened, what we saw. So I'm more likely to retain what you've seen, what, what you've said. <clears throat> That's on my throat there. I'm more likely to retain you if you repeat. So it's just kind of a reminder. This is what we saw. Then finally, at the end, we have to have our concluding remarks. Just like the introduction, you know, there's, fur there's further reading in the chapter, but there are some sort of basic ways to conclude. Probably the best and most effective is to tie it back into the attention getter. So if you pull us in, so if you talk about statistics and sexually transmitted diseases, you can go out there and finish with, and you can have a final statement. So please use protection if you're going to have sex. Don't be one-third of 18 to 35 years, years old. The person that had the speech on, um, on a boycott of Nestle, you know, she brought that image back and said, this is what happens. You know, this baby, and she talked about the second baby, she said, this baby died as a direct result of these policies. They put the, it down. So those are the best ones that tie us back into it. You can have a call to action, especially persuasion. That final, here's what I want you to do. Um, you can have a final statement. Here's some, some some concluding words. So that's important to consider because for your audience, we're going to drift in and out. But we're really with you at the beginning and we're really with you at the end. So it's really important to put some extra emphasis on that. Okay? So again, this is the Aristotelian outline, basic organizational structure. If there's anything you don't understand, email me and I'll be happy to explain further.